On Monday, January 8th, at 7.18 UTC, the Vulcan Centaur rocket lifted off for the first time. On board, the Peregrine Mission 1 lunar lander. After successfully performing its job, Centaur inserted the lander into a trans-lunar injection. What followed was a roller coaster of updates and emotion that not only showcased Astrobotics' trailblazing transparency, but also fascinated space nerds across the globe. Let's take a look at the whole story. Initially, everything seemed great. A photo tweeted by Astrobotic at 9.10 UDC showed Vulcan during liftoff and noted, Peregrine has wings. Our Peregrine lander successfully launched to the moon and established ground communications with our DHL mission control center. So far so good, however, the first of many so-called Peregrine Mission 1 updates just came hours later at 2.37 PM UDC. This update notes, Unfortunately, an anomaly occurred which prevented Astrobotic from achieving a stable sun-pointing orientation. The team is responding in real time as the situation unfolds and will be providing updates as data is obtained and analyzed. This is probably a good time to talk about the payload here. Peregrine Mission 1 is a lunar lander built by the company Astrobotic. It's 1,283 kilograms in mass and as part of NASA's commercial lunar payload services, it got a slot on the first Vulcan rocket to go to the moon. It does feature 16 customers who hope to reach the moon with it. So, the first problem Astrobotic here is talking about is achieving a stable sun pointing orientation. Let's talk about that. I booted up Kerbal for a quick demonstration of why that is the problem. See, the lander has the solar panel on its roof, which makes sense if you are on the moon. You get the sun mostly from above. However, during travel, you might get into a situation where the sun is behind you, which happened here. Or at least not fully pointed in a way where they could achieve power positive behavior. And since the thrusters were not behaving, they could not point the vehicle back to the sun again. So overall, two problems. The propulsion is not working and you're running out of power. Both are very suboptimal if you want to land on the moon. Astrobotic confirmed that they had six hours to fix the solar panel issue before the lander would run out of power. Update 2 then confirmed exactly what was suspected. Because they could not point, they could not properly charge the battery. The team believes that the likely cause of the unstable sun pointing is a propulsion anomaly that if proven true, threatens the ability of the spacecraft to soft land on the moon. As the team fights to troubleshoot the issue, the spacecraft battery is reaching operationally low levels. Just before entering a known period of communication outage, the team developed and executed an improvised maneuver to reorient the solar panels towards the sun. Of course, having no or just suboptimal propulsion at this point dangers any possible soft landing. Even with all systems working, landing on the moon is very difficult. Landing on the moon with problematic propulsion gets to the point of impossibility. At this point, the goal was first to extend the life of the lander. If they would be able to charge the batteries, they would be able to extend and at least fight longer. So they did exactly that. And then just 90 minutes after update 2. We have successfully re-established communications with Peregrine after the known communication blackout. We are now charging the battery. So at least the lander would not die based on battery power for now. However, they are still fighting a bigger problem. The Mission Anomaly board continues to evaluate the data we are receiving and is assessing the status of what we believe to be the root of the anomaly, a failure within the propulsion system. And sadly, just a bit later than the confirmation. Unfortunately, it appears the failure within the propulsion system is causing a critical loss of propellant. The team is working to try and stabilize the loss, but given the situation, we have prioritized maximizing the science and data we can capture. We are currently assessing what alternative mission profiles may be feasible at this time. In other words, the lander already lost too much propellant to land on the moon. 
even if the team would be able to stop it at this given time, the lander would not have the necessary propellants to perform a soft landing. So instead of that, they are helping payloads to achieve maybe secondary goals or part of their goals in a way that they are maximizing the science time they can give payloads and themselves right now. Next to this, this is also the first time they released a picture of the lander in space. In this, you can see the so-called multi-layer installation or MLI in the foreground. According to Astrobotic, the disturbance or the dents you can see here are the first visual clue that aligns with their telemetry system, which points to a propulsion system anomaly. At this point, the battery is fully charged and they are using all the power and energy they have to perform science and payload operation. Basically, give their customers science time and save what they can save. The engineers working on the Peregrine Mission 1 are now awake for more than 24 hours and they still try to save as much as they can out of this mission while providing amazing communication on X and their blog. The next update, 6 hours later, confirms that the Attitude Control System is currently working to fight against the ongoing propellant leak. To explain, the leak could cause the system to start tumble and with that would lead to less sun exposure and a loss of mission. The ACS was never thought to fire this long, but if they can continue to do this, Astrobotic hopes to extend the science time in space to more than 40 hours and get to the lunar distance as much as they can. Overnight, the team then faced another pointing issue which they solved and once again confirmed that landing on the moon had sadly become impossible. However, they are already collecting valuable data for their next lander mission, Griffin, which is planned on a Falcon Heavy. All valuable time, not only for the company itself, but for the payloads on board to provide at least some value from their instruments. And first results of this data came in a bit later, as Astrobotics presented their current theory of why the system failed. Astrobotics' current hypothesis about the Peregrine spacecraft's propulsion anomaly is that a valve between the helium pressurant and the oxidizer failed to reseal after actuation during initialization. This led to a rush of high pressure helium that spiked the pressure in the oxidizer tank beyond its operating limit and subsequently ruptured the tank. While this is a working theory, a full analysis report will be produced by a former review board made up of industry experts after the mission is complete. A helium tank is usually used to repressure tanks and spacecraft. With the valve of that not completely closing again, you put too much pressure into the oxygen tank, which then brings it beyond the limits and breaks it. That also explains the disturbance in the MLI from earlier. The tank simply ruptured. The CEO of Astrobotics, John Thornton, later underlined this theory at a press conference and confirmed the oxidizer side seemed to be the cause of the anomaly. So the first parts of propulsion in, uh, initiation worked really well. We were seeing balancing of pressures in the tanks as, as some of the valves started opening. Um, everything looked nominal. Uh, one of the final steps of that initialization is the firing of a valve to open uh, the helium to the fuel side and the oxidizer side. Uh, the fuel side appeared to open successfully. Um, the oxidizer side uh, ap appeared to have a problem. And we believe that our leading theory has not changed at this point. Um, we're we're going to be looking at this very heavily with a, a uh, anomaly review board. But what appears to have happened is that that valve um, connecting the, the helium to the oxidizer did not properly reseat. Um, and sent a, a rush of helium down into the oxidizer side. Um, and I describe it as a rush because it was very, very fast. Uh, within a little over a minute, um, the, the pressure had risen to the point in the oxidizer side that it was well beyond the, the proof limit of the propulsion tank and the, uh, the, uh, the oxidizer side of the, the tank. Um, and we believe at that point the tank ruptured um, and led to, a, um, and unfortunately, a, a, a catastrophic um, loss of propellant at that point for the for the primary mission. One big question at this point was where would Peregrine end up? Would it cycle around or would it re-enter Earth? Maybe even crash into the moon at some point? At update 10, the company believed it would reach the moon in the second swing by, going back to Earth, swinging back and then meeting the moon, which at this point might be a nice word for hitting it without the propulsion to break. On the science front, Peregrine managed to communicate with all the 9 payloads it was designed to communicate with and all 10 payloads who wanted power have received power. 
this means that data gathering from the payloads is in place as well, which will hopefully give the science teams at least some data to look at. This includes payloads like the radiation detector, four spectrometers, a landing sensor and a navigation lidar sensor. All probably plan to receive data from the moon, but hey, they at least get some proof of concept of their instrument in space. All the NASA science payloads that could operate by being powered on did receive power and effectively gathered data during the time Peregrine was in flight. The NASA payload teams adjusted their operations and were able to demonstrate we believe that they could have operated if those instruments had reached the moon. And then we finally got the answer where Peregrine will end up. And ironically, it will return to where it started. Quote unquote, our latest assessment now shows the spacecraft is on a path towards Earth, where it will likely burn up in Earth's atmosphere. The team is currently assessing options and we will update as soon as we are able. At this point, Peregrine Mission 1 was operating in a different situation than expected for over five days, at a distance of 242,000 miles away from Earth. The reason why it will now end up on Earth was the leak. It changed the trajectory and also slowed the lander down, meaning the perigee lowered quite a lot. It would no longer fly by the Earth, but fly into Earth. At this point, Astrobotic could have used the remaining propulsion to pass Earth and go back to crash on the moon. But they decided otherwise. It became more silent after this around the little lander, probably coming down to the fact that there is only so much to talk about. It won't land on the moon, but science will be conducted. Another update, update 21 at this point, was released on January 18th. Peregrine has been operating in space for 10 days and 8 hours, and it's approximately 30,000 miles above Earth, continuing its controlled re-entry. The trajectory remains on track with our planned path towards a safe area over open water in the South Pacific. The vehicle is stable, operational and responsive. We remain in contact with appropriate government authorities to keep them informed of the vehicle position and planned trajectory, which remains unchanged. And attached to this is a picture of Earth, as visible from the lander. The image is completely unaltered and was recorded like this. For this photo to take place, the team turned the spacecraft to reposition it, so the sun is hidden behind the thin payload deck strut just to the left of Earth. Otherwise, the picture would have been oversaturated. And with this view, Peregrine re-entered as planned and ended its mission. Shortly after this picture, we got an even better view. Peregrine captured a video of the moment when it successfully separated from the Vulcan rocket at the beginning of its mission. What a stunning view back to Earth. Next to this, Astrobotic published a final statement. As expected. Astrobotic lost telemetry with the Peregrine spacecraft at around 3.50 p.m. EST. While this indicates the vehicle completed its controlled re-entry over open water in the South Pacific at 4.04 p.m. EST, we await independent confirmation from government entities. Just want to stay, say right off the top what a wild adventure we were just on. Um, certainly not the uh, outcome we were hoping for and um, uh, certainly challenging right up front, but man, um, got really exciting through the course of it and there's, there's a lot of story to tell here. While Paragene was not able to reach its primary mission goals, it still managed to provide science time and data. Astrobotic demonstrated persistence with the mission and transparency to the public. That is hard to do, especially in times when things do not go as planned. For the future, Astrobotic has planned more landings and I'm sure the data they gathered here will help Griffin to touch down on the moon.